All right, so uh, thank you again for uh, Kevin joining us as well as uh, Dan and thank you, uh, Michelle, uh, for being our uh, education uh, for the level one uh, teaching and coaching associate development day. Uh, first, Kevin, if you'd like to give us a brief background uh, on how you got to golf tech and just uh, being in the industry, what, what drove you to choosing a career in golf? And, sure. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. So uh, I could probably start all the way back at the beginning when I was in um, high school. Um, Laytonsville Golf Course is right down the street from me. I participated in a junior camp, and uh, Dean Greer, who was the head professional at the time, was kind enough to give me an opportunity to get out there and play and practice for free. Um, which my brother, who was in the PGM program at Mississippi State, said I was an idiot for not doing. So I decided to go ahead and start doing it. Really fell in love with the whole environment, um, and then got into golf that way. I went through Campbell PGM Uni University and. Um, graduated out of there in 2008 and I worked at the Chevy Chase Club. I was there for about three seasons and had a lot of interest in biomechanics and um, fitness and ended up going to golf tech because I knew there was going to be an opportunity to see a lot of people. Um, they had the motion sensors which was the one of the major uh, reasons for going there because I could then measure what was going on with the body and as I got more into it um, just fell more in love with teaching and um, now that's basically all I do. So as I've come through golf tech, um, I started out just as a coach. I was doing a lot of teaching, was doing some fitness stuff as well um, with them, and then um, just got too busy to where I couldn't really do the fitness stuff anymore. Then I was promoted to uh, center manager um, when our manager moved on to another facility, um, and then uh, recently moved up to regional manager, where now I oversee. A lot of the operation um, in the Maryland area and also in Virginia some and uh, kind of have changed some of my role from being a, a teacher of students to a teacher of teachers so I do a lot of um, management of the managers of different facilities and then a lot of the um, teaching quality discussions for all of the coaches in the market so we've got about um, 20 that I oversee now. Um, the market was a little bit bigger last year and because it was so big and we were adding on so much staff, um, we ended up splitting the market between myself and one other uh, regional manager. But uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, I really love working for Golf Tech. It's a great company. They're very innovative, coming up with a lot of great ideas. So yeah, it's me. Cool. All right. Well, first, what is your uh, teaching philosophy over there? So uh, teaching philosophy is kind of tricky. I think when looking at it, I uh, would say the major thing is we're teaching everybody's goals. So I wouldn't say that there is really one specific philosophy that you should have when you're teaching. Um, if you could approach this from the end of everybody has their own specific problems, your goal is to be able to assess what they're doing and then provide some instruction on how to fix their problems. That's really what I think the teaching philosophy is. Um, now, our mission statement at Golf Tech is to help people play better golf. So it could be as simple as that. Okay, and um, what's the best advice you can just give to beginning instructors, just getting into it and how to kind of keep their cool, calm down their nerves and uh, be able to provide the information that they know throughout a lesson and kind of keep it under control? I would say the you have got to have a sound basis for how to construct a golf lesson. So, um, and that starts at the very beginning phase of observing what's happening with the ball flight and then understanding what is happening at impact that's creating that specific problem. So you could have five major problems that you could have. It could be the club's hitting the ground in the wrong place. So it could be a low point problem. Um, it could be a face to path problem where the ball is curving too much one direction or the other. Or it could be a club path problem where the club path is just moving too dramatically outside in or inside out. 
those are really going to be the basis, the three major basis of a lesson. But you could also have a problem with distance where they're just not hitting it far enough. Um, or you could also have a um, on-course skill problem. So they're not good at selecting targets or they have some other aspect of their game that's just not very good that they need to improve. Um, but most of the time where I see beginning instructors go the wrong route is they haven't spent enough time in the beginning phase of identifying what the ball flight is. So, you know, it's pretty simple. It's either the shot pushes, pulls, or goes straight, and it either uh, fades, slices, or um, draw hooks. So it's going to start in some direction. So it's going to be either pull, push, or a fade, or a, a, a pull, push, or straight. And then it's going to have one of those curves on there. So once you can identify those two aspects of it, you can generally tell what's the club face position at impact and what's the club path doing. And then from there, you can start to build your lesson. Because what happens when people get going sideways is they haven't spent enough time in that phase of identifying the ball flight. And then they haven't spent um, the time before giving instruction on looking at what aspect of the, um, of the impact or of the swing they're gonna change whether that be low point face path or path. So they'll just dive right in and go, hey, this one thing looks really weird. And I observed that this one thing looks bad. So I'm going to go ahead and try to fix that. And the ball flight never changes. And then all of a sudden the lesson starts going sideways because the coach starts providing a bunch of different ideas of how to change the ball flight when they haven't really taken the time to understand what's happening first. And would you agree the most you can be discussing in terms of swing changes is two pieces of information you can't really be throwing so many um or so many things at them in terms of uh changing up their swing i mean how, yes. how many pieces of changes would you would you want in a, a player swing during during a lesson i would say one maximum of two in some scenarios uh typically it's one but what could happen is if you're working on um let's say you're working on the downswing, you could have one cue for beginning the downswing and one cue for the follow through. And then you could then, so that, that would be two cues, but you're really just connecting the dots between the two pieces. Saying, you know, as you're starting down, you wanna feel like this, and then after you hit the ball, you wanna feel like that. Um, so those two pieces can work together. Or if you're doing something that's really far apart, so, if you're changing something with the grip because they're struggling with a curvature problem and you change their grip from being an open face grip to a closed face grip and then you have one other cue of you know okay when you're swinging the club i don't want you to roll your arms over right you know those two things would somewhat line up together keep you moving in the same direction and could be two cues that are easy enough for somebody to handle but for sure if it's if you're working on it and it's taking more than five minutes for you to give the instruction or for, and for them to be able to adapt it, don't give them anything new. Because okay. it's going to take them a long they, time. They comprehend and, and are able to kind of successfully do it on their own in a, a decent, uh, like six out of 10 times or seven out of 10 times, they're able to. Uh, yeah, it should be quick. So, yeah, if you were going to change their grip, let's say they had a very open face grip, so their uh, lead hand is turned a lot towards the target, and then you gave them the instruction of, all right, well, I want you to have your hand turned more away from the target, you should be able to see two knuckles on your hand, whatever it ends up being. If you give them that cue, and then the next four swings, they grab the club the same way, and they can see the two knuckles, perfect. You don't have to work on it. You could give them something else. Mm -hmm. um you can give them the second piece uh, but if you're giving them the instruction and the next swing that they do their hands right back to where it was before or it's only turned slightly and then you have to keep providing more feedback to get them where you want them to be then um don't give them anything else because they're not going to be able to handle it all right perfect now what type of uh swing software and technology are you using at golf tech 
So we've got quite a bit. Um, we use the Polhemus uh, 3D system. So we use a, a shoulder and a hip sensor, one that goes um, really high up uh, in between the shoulder blades, about as high as you can get on the thoracic spine, and one that goes right on the sacrum. And then we also have Foresight GC2, and we have a quad in each center. We have one quad in each center, um, but we have um, the GC2s there and all the rest of the bays. We also have um, high-speed cameras, so proprietary cameras that we had built for indoor use. Um, and then we obviously have a computer station that we run all of our software on. So we have our own proprietary um, TechSwing software that we use that has you know, the ability to pull in motion sensors and ball flight data, and pull up Tor Pros and all that in the same place. And then also in that program, we have the option of being able to record content. So in all of our lessons, we um, record content relative to whatever it is that we're working on. And then we save that and that uploads to the students um, clubhouse where they can then go back and access those videos. They can see their swings and videos. We have a huge library of drills that we attach to all of our lessons. And then we also put in notes on there too. Great. Now, do you have it? You, you, so are you ever going to think of maybe investing in some type of uh, putting technology like a sand putting lab or a, a Tomi system? Yeah, so we do actually have some putting stuff that we have as well. So we um, we use the a company called Biomech that has a little device that hooks up to the putter that measures what's going on with it. Um, so we do use that as well. And then we have a bunch of our own custom training aids that we've built for putting assessments, um, and then also just um, putting lessons. Okay, uh, I got a question for uh, Michelle. What technology do you have over at the Education Center? Last I was there, I know you had the Tomi system, um, but what's, uh, what other uh, technology do you have over there during the uh, level one, level two, and level three seminars? Uh, yes, we have three different simulators for full swing, um, and we do have a force plate, uh, force plate as well. Um, swing Catalyst is one of the systems we have, as well as Foresight. I'm not sure what the third one is. Um, and then we also have a SAM putting lab that we use for our students. Okay, so you went to the SAM putting lab now. All right. Perfect. I remember giving Eric a hard time on how to pronounce uh, the Tommy system. I was just irritating him saying it's the Tommy system. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so during your lesson, uh, Kevin, um, how do you explain the, the, the data that's shown on uh, your swing software for any type of player, beginner to competitive to understand uh, and this isn't really including club face angle or uh, ball speed or club head speed, but more uh, in-depth data that you actually, you, you need to know and uh, you'd like them to know, but you want them to understand it, but you also don't want them to just kind of think about that specific uh, piece of data. But how would you kind of explain best in regards to various uh, data that they'll see? That is a definitely an art. Um, you really have to know the player in terms of what their comprehension level is, and then how much information would be too much for them. So the one, um, I mean, that's tough. Uh, the biggest thing is making sure that whatever data point it is that's going to be recommended to the student <clears throat> matches um, whatever is needed to solve their problem. So a lot of times I see instructors giving out too much data of, um, you know, they might be working on some specific thing. So uh, let's say somebody's swinging the club over the top and they're working on getting their shoulders to be closed more at the top of the backswing, so turning more. And they give them their turn number and then all of a sudden they start providing all of this other stuff of here's what your shoulders are tilting like, and this is how much they're bending, and this is what the ball flight's doing, and throwing all this data out there that's really useless. It's up to the instructor to understand all of that data, be able to assimilate that into some type of a systematic thought process, and then 
identify what the student's problem is, and then provide any specific data. So very rarely in a lesson will I get deep into the specifics of the numbers, um, only occasionally and only after I've built that over you know, months of understanding. So a lot of times I'll have students where we might get into um, D-plane discussion and angle of attack and how that influences the path. While up to that point, I've been talking about path very generically as the swing direction that we would see on a two-dimensional camera. Um, but then as, they, as I know that they understand that and I quiz them on it over multiple lessons of, okay, here's the ball flight, what's happening, why is this happening? Then will I get into the numbers of it and start to go into, you know, here's how much it's curving and this is the problem and uh, all that stuff. So I would say the flow of information is an art. It's really challenging to say for one specific person that you would provide a lot of data versus very little. But even in a scenario where I've seen some students that are like, yeah, give me all the data because I want it. Uh, start to provide them with some of that data and all of a sudden their head explodes and they don't know where to go or what to do. So yeah, it can be a little tricky. Okay. All right. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. That does because, you know, sometimes I'll get to use the track man during a lesson and I see all this data and I, I want to I want to tell them some key pieces of, inf of information, but they might be in their 60s and, you know, they could probably could care less what the track man says. They just want to hit that ball a little bit higher and a little bit farther. And I, I don't want to talk to, you know, a Mrs. Havocamp about spin rate or club yeah. rate angle. I, I just, you know, I just, I just want them to be able to come back. I remember when I was uh, in high school, I was in 10th grade, I was put on flight scope with a instructor, uh, he'll be renamed, or he won't be named, but it was at a place called Golf Quest, and he started talking about ball height, and, we, and then he was talking about club face angle, and then he said, oh, look, look at your club path as well, but we really need to get the ball a little bit higher, and then I was just, I, all I thought about was coming down on the ball too much. Next thing I know, my club face is closed severely, and then I'm trying to open the club face, thinking that's going to uh, increase the height on the golf ball. So it, I didn't go back after the first lesson because I just didn't know what he was talking about. I left after the one hour lesson and I was just like, what did, what did I just learn or what, what, what did I just do? And I, I couldn't remember. Yeah, for sure. That's one of those where I think, again, you know, if you don't have those first two pieces of a clear observation of what the ball flight's doing and then an orientation as to here's what you need to do to fix that a problem and you start to get into a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter so okay so when you get a, a new student at golf tech what what key elements when you're interviewing them do you uh, kind of look for uh to conduct a successful lesson you, yeah so um or, yeah sorry this one's kind of a tricky one because uh we don't do one-off lessons so we do a swing evaluation as really the student's first lesson. And we do it with the idea that we're trying to gain a student for the long term versus somebody for just one or two, um, which is kind of tricky because when we're going through and uh, we have a number of touch points before we really even get to this point. So a lot of times we'll have somebody that calls in and they don't really know what they want, but they know that they potentially want instruction. And so we then can ask them some questions, book them for their swing evaluation, and then we set up a pre-evaluation phone call. So in the pre-evaluation phone call is where we would do a lot of our interview, and we ask about everything. So, you know, what are their goals? Um, we ask about all the different aspects of their game, driving irons, short game, putting, bunkers, course management. Um, all of those major elements that are going to be uh, necessary for them to improve. And um, so from the second question there in terms of the detail, and we get into a lot of detail in that call, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to go through and do that. And we're doing that before we've ever even seen the person take a swing. So a lot of times in that conversation, we'll uncover a ton of different problems that the student has. And I think that sometimes instructors can be very narrowly focused 
on, I have this person coming to me right now and this is their lesson and I don't, I'm not gonna see them again. So I have to fix whatever it is that I have to fix. In our scenario, we're gaining all of the information on the front end and then going, okay, here is what you have going on. Your major goal is to do this. You have all of these other things that are a problem. So in order for you to get from here to here, from your goal to where you want, we need to do something to solve all of these issues. And that's typically gonna be done with more lessons. So uh, that's where I think that in order to conduct a successful lesson, um, I think you kind of have to look at it from two different avenues. One is from the first lesson. So in order to conduct a successful first lesson, you need all that information to be able to give them a good recommendation for what to do. Um, one in that lesson that you're giving them, and then the other is what to do in subsequent lessons if they decide to come back. And then if you're looking at it from uh, the success of one individual lesson when somebody is coming in, in order to make that successful, you have to have a clear understanding of what their goal is. Um, not necessarily even just the goal of that specific lesson, but what their long-term goal is. And then, um, just like I was saying earlier, you kind of have to have a system there to be able to identify where you're going wrong during the lesson and how to get yourself back on track. Okay. Well, that, that kind of also answers the, the second question too, of how much detail do you put into your interview? And that is a lot of detail talking about every aspect of their game. I actually think that's, that's great. You're just preparing yourself and getting all that stuff out of the way. So your 60 minute lesson, starts the second that they get in there. Yeah, for sure. And even when we go through and do that first part of the lesson, we recap a lot of that discussion of here's all the things that we talked about, that all the problems that you have with your game. Is this still correct first? And then is there anything that you want to add? Is there anything you thought of between when we had that call to right now? And sometimes we'll get that where we'll have people that'll go, yeah, you know, I was thinking about my putting and it's really bad or, you know, I hate hitting off uneven lies. I can't hit it out of the rough. All those things are important to understand before you can provide some good um, solutions. Okay. Now, when you're uh, giving lessons to beginners to all the way to advanced and juniors, what areas do you most frequently see yourself working on um, based on that player's ability as a beginner, intermediate, advanced player? Yeah, so... That's a good question. I think this was one where I could probably lean a little bit on some of the data we've collected that 90% um, of the students that come in to see us, and this is over about 60,000 inquiries, 90% um, of the students that come in to see us are hitting a shot that's either inconsistent or slices. Actually, it's higher than that. It's 90, I think it's 94%. So, um, and then 90% of students want to hit a shot that's either straight or drawing. So that kind of helps to lead a little bit into, you know, what are we working on most often? Most often we're working on getting a student to curve the ball from right to left to hit a push draw. So frequently, regardless of what the player's ability level is, um, you know, certainly as you get more into the advanced player, they tend to have less of the problem of um, curving it to the right, but a lot of times they still do. So most of the time we're working on path. So, um, well, actually, we're working on path, a low point, and face to path. Those are kind of the three big ones. But most of the time, beginners, intermediate, and even advanced players that aren't tour players aren't moving their bodies enough. So they're not turning enough in the beginning part of the backswing. They're not bending backwards enough to keep themselves stable and not sway away from the ball. And then they're not swaying enough towards the target um, or turning themselves open. So um, what we've found going through all of our studies, um, we actually published something called a swing true study. So you could go in and take a look at that. It highlights the six um, motion measurements that are high high have a highest correlation to skill level so we took um i believe the study is more than this now but at the beginning part of it it was thirty thousand students and we plotted in their handicap and all of their motion measurement we gave all of that data to 
um, a couple different universities and um, like golf science labs and had them go through and just pull all the data out and say, what is the highest correlation? And the six um, that are on the swing through study were the ones that were the highest correlated. There were others that had some correlation, but it wasn't as strong. And um, that helps to show some of the things that we've seen. And for the most part of those six measurements that we're looking at, um, amateurs, even to a lower handicappers, just aren't moving themselves enough. Okay, perfect. Now, how do you explain, clarify, and reinforce changes and adjustments in a player's swing? So there's a um, there's a couple different things. Uh, you know, on to kind of the second portion of this too, you know, visual, auditory, tactile, in terms of how the student learns. I would say that there's very, it's a very rare scenario that you're gonna have a student that learns in only one of those ways, that they're only visual, only auditory, only tactile. They're typically a blend of multiples. So in some scenarios, they might be a stronger visual learner, and then they have some auditory component as well. So it's kind of both. And the way we approach it is by trying to provide everything. So um, the good thing about being in the bays at Golf Tech is that we're in a controlled environment. So, I mean, it's like a lab setting. You got somebody hooked up with a sensor, they're hitting a ball off of a perfect lie into a net. So we don't have any um, concern about where the golf ball is gonna go. They're able to make the motion. And then we do have biofeedback tones we can set as well. So they're able to see their golf swing up on a monitor that's up on the wall. So once they hit a shot, the we're able to then show them, here's what you did, here's what happened with the ball flight, um, and then set some type of a biofeedback beep if we need to change some of their movement. But in order for somebody to be able to learn something, they really need to have the intrinsic feeling of what it is that they're doing that's creating emotion. So if we provide feedback to them, hey, you're swinging the club over the top, I need you to turn more in the backswing in order to get yourself to get the path more inside to out, I'm gonna set a beep for it. They do the swing, the beep sounds, great. What did it feel like to produce that? They say whatever it is, we then turn the beep off, they hit the shot, and then ask them before we take a look at the video, how did that feel like you did on that one? Did that feel like you turned yourself enough? They'll say yes or no. We then look at the video to provide the evidence of, yes, you did, great, let's keep going with that feeling until it doesn't work. Um, or if it didn't work, okay, well, let's change that, try to come up with a different feeling. So that's where typically, um, and, and this will change slightly here now that this uh, whole COVID thing has been going on. Most of the time, I would say 85% uh, of the time, we're trying to change swings just by using auditory cues and then biofeedback. Um, now, occasionally you'll have, and this is kind of the lower segment as I've seen it, most of the time people can get it with the visual and then with the auditory cue. Occasionally they need some type of a training aid in there to help produce a, mo a movement. So it could be the biofeedback tone, or a lot of times we use a pool noodle in order to change path. And so we could hold a pool noodle out there and they do it and they change it. But the one thing that will change is the whole kinesthetic one of, you know, touching them, moving them around. That just isn't gonna happen anymore, at least not for the near future, because we can't get that close to people while providing the lesson. And um, so I think the visual and auditory component will be a bigger piece of it and trying to figure out more creative ways of how can we get somebody to do something without touching them. Okay, and uh, what kind of training aid do you see you like working with the most or with what training aid do you like to work with the most? So the only training aids that we use are pool noodles. We don't really use any other training aids. The, um, there's a couple different reasons for that. So, um, and uh, we do have a couple training aids for putting that we have. So uh, I'm not a huge proponent of training aids for a number of different reasons, mainly because the training aids can a lot of times be a crutch. 
and the student gets used to using the training aid. And, uh, and certainly this has been one of my biggest pet peeves as I've gone around to all the facilities is there are some that have their own training aids that they've built. I'm like, get that out of there because that doesn't help the student learn first. Um, because then it doesn't provide the intrinsic feeling of what it is that they need in order to be able to achieve something. So it just gives them the crutch of, hey, just use this training aid and it'll work. Um, so the training aid is only as useful as its ability to get the student to feel what it is that they need. And then a lot of times, uh, this is something I learned from Jason over at Peak, is that a lot of times training aids are biomechanically backwards. Um, so the best one, uh, the best example of one is the uh, trying to keep your elbows together where you can put the ball that's in between your arms where you have to try to squeeze the ball together in your elbows like that. Or you have the other thing where you've got the bands that pull your arms together. So the one where the ball is in the middle, you actually have to use your muscles to keep the ball connected. The other one where the bands are on your arms and they're actively pushing you together you're using your muscles to resist against that. So you're actually learning to use the muscles that are gonna move yourself the opposite direction. So that's one of those where whenever I see a training aid, I almost always look at that first of what are they trying to accomplish and does it actually do that? Okay, I saw Debbie Doniger use uh, bands on, uh, she was doing a, a video online. She used bands for the lower body, like right around the knees to prevent your knees from coming in and then also on the downswing um kind of pushing your knees out would that be kind of similar in terms of uh with the elbows so she's trying to keep the knees from collapsing in yeah so hang on oh yeah i think i know what you're talking about and i would say that if you're if you're doing that right if if your knees are the problem is your knees are moving in towards each other if you went through and used bands to resist against that, that would work because now you're using the muscles that are gonna actually keep your knees farther apart. Yeah, so she had, um, I don't know if you could. Yeah, I can see it. Band right here, and then she was, uh, she was saying in the backswing, uh, instead of preventing your knee from coming in like that, try to take your backswing, but push your knees out and, uh, go against the resistance of the band to prevent your knee from coming in. And then on that downswing, feel your knees coming out to come through and to power through and get your body around. That's what she was kind of focusing on. So yeah. That's really kind of the definition of it. It's kind of reversed in terms of, um, you know, the intrinsic feeling. No, that would work. If you're trying to keep your knees apart, so, uh, you know, that's a perfect example. You're trying to keep your knees apart. So you need to have, in order for your knees to stay apart, you need to have the muscles on the outside of your body pulling your knees apart. So that would work. Um, if you were trying to do that to keep your knees from collapsing together and you put a ball in between your knees, now you're using your muscles to keep the knees together. So that would be, that would be one where it would be opposite of it. So. Okay. Based on what she's talking about with that, that would work. I don't know that I really understand what she's trying to do with that. That doesn't really make any sense to me, but um, sure, yes, that would work. All right, well, we're halfway through the teaching and coaching uh, video. Does anybody uh, have any questions for Kevin um, in regards to what he's uh, discussed so far? You can take yourself off uh, audio mute if you'd like. Tyler or Brendan or um, Alex, do you have any questions for uh, Kevin so far? No, I'm good so far. This is Alex. Okay. Perfect. Brendan, I saw you. That was, that was pretty, uh, that was pretty in depth. I really enjoyed it. Okay. So off to the next one. Describe the demonstrations you used to make uh, to clarify and reinforce key points and relative cues. Uh, do you do any comparison videos with tour players or just their comparisons from first swing to uh, their first lesson to when they're on their fifth swing and they or on their fifth lesson and it's right at the end of the lesson in terms of them visually seeing the improvements they make? For sure. So 
Uh, kind of like I said on the last one with all of the feedback, yeah, we're giving feedback on tons of different stuff. So um, we do have requirements for all of our lessons that you have to have a before and an after swing. So we um, almost always will save one of the first swings that they've done or whatever swing we want to look at to analyze and provide the lesson off of. We save that as the before. And then we'll save an after swing at some point throughout the lesson when they produce the motion we want. And then um, we do use tour player comparison. So we're fortunate that Nick Clearwater is our VP of instruction who actually works with some tour players. So he went out to a tour event a couple of years ago and got tons of great tour video, high definition of some of the best guys now. So that has been really helpful to have that. Um, so a lot of times we'll do that where we'll, um, at the beginning of the lesson, once we observe what's going on the, with the ball flight and then we're oriental ending the lesson to a specific problem, we'll use a tour player comparison. Um, I would say, you know, some coaches are better at doing this than others, but um, I would say most of the time as I'm doing it, I'd say 90% of the lessons will have a tour player comparison at some point in the lesson to illustrate a specific point of what's happening. So who I'm using, is all relative to whatever the problem is. Um, and then, yeah, using student uh, swing comparisons too, for sure, would be helpful. All right, and just out of personal opinion, what's your, what's your favorite golf swing on tour? Uh, it could be a current tour player, it could be a past tour player. Um, gosh, that's a great question. There's a lot that are good for different reasons. So, I wouldn't say that I had any one specific swing that I was like, yeah, man, that is awesome. Um, you know, everybody's got their own different things that they're doing. And a lot of times they're doing it because they're trying to control the ball flight one way or the other. So um, I use, I typically use a lot of um, Zach Johnson front and side view. Because again, we're typically trying to get people to curve the ball from right to left. And he does a really good job of having all of the variables that are necessary for somebody to draw the ball. Um, now, whether or not I like his swing visually and think that it's really nice, probably not. Um, I think the best looking swing that I've seen in a long time was Ricky Fowler, the year that he was working with Butch Harmon, um, where he didn't get the club as laid off at the top of the backswing. It was just really awesome. I thought he looked great at that point, but he's since gone away from that. Yeah, personally, I like Freddie Couples just because it's a nice, long, rhythmic, effortless swing, and it just looks – Yeah, sure. Beautiful swing. I, I don't know. Some, something about his swing, it's just, just that long, rhythmic motion, and it, it just looks so effortless. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Dan, do you have any uh, favorite – swings on tour or pass swings hogan ben hogan that, that was a quick answer yes all right ben hogan <laughs> now i imagine you might have a, a picture of him hitting his uh his one iron do you have a picture of that only in my head only in your head all right, now, uh, now I know what to get you for Christmas. Uh, what common and successful drills do you suggest to help incorporate the swing changes that you're working on? So if you could just think of like two or three swing changes and then just uh, kind of talk about those successful, successful drills. Yeah, so um, probably the first one is the most common, which is not getting the hand path working in enough from uh, – the beginning of the backswing to when the club's parallel to the ground. We call it the uh, wall club death drill. You would just stand up against a wall. So you'd put your butt up against the wall and then you do your backswing and try to get your hands back so that they touch the wall um, without getting the hands up. So if you move the hands up higher into the backswing and you don't touch the wall, the hands aren't deep enough. That's a really good one. Um, the other one is uh, a screwdriver drill, um, which is a lot of times people tend to have their wrist in extension in the downswing. So as they're coming down, their wrist is like that, which tends to keep the face open. So that would be a 
screwdriver drill is just move your wrist like a screwdriver. Just take a screwdriver in your hand and do that. And then you move your wrist into flexion. It helps to close the face of the path. Um, and then the third one would be uh, grip. So grip is one that's always tricky to teach. But a really good way to do this is with some dots on your hand. So if you put some dots, I'll draw these dots on here. You draw some dots on your hand. You could do one on your lead hand. You would do it right on the middle of this. Uh, um, think about how I'm doing this. Yeah. So it'd be right on this bottom part of the heel pad, right there. And then you do another one on the first knuckle, the first joint there of your index finger. So you can see the dots are on the hand like that. Mm -hmm. And then basically, you would try to position those dots relative to the spine of the club. So when the club face is square, if you had a more closed face grip, you would have both dots on the trail side of the grip. So your hand would be over like this. And if you wanted it to be in a more open face position, you would have the hands on the lead side, or you'd have those dots on the lead side of the grip. Uh, I don't have a grip here in my um, room here, but um, that's a really easy way to get the left hand position or the lead hand position on the golf club. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the last one that you would have is on your uh, trail hand. You would put another dot here on that. Actually, you know what? I did that wrong. I did the wrong hand. Here you go. It's this part of the hand. Sorry about that. It's the, it's the dot on the, uh, on that fatty part. And then you'd put the other one on this part of your wrist, like right in the dimple that you're creating, like this. And then the dot would be on the other finger on your right hand, like that. Mm -hmm. So now wherever those dots line up, help to put your hand on the club. Um, that's, that's a great drill. Those are probably the three of the best, most common drills. The dots on the hand, um, and then the uh, screwdriver drill and the hand drill. But again, the dots are, are this way. Lead hand in this little dimple where you're putting that has a big role to play in what's happening with the, um, the face to path. And then again, this one on that heel pad. So those two. And then on your trail hand, it's just right on that index finger and putting that basically on the back of the club. Okay, and quick explanation before this second question. We have a member who's, uh, uh, Brendan knows exactly who I'm talking about, but he, he's constantly working on the mechanics of his swing and always thinks of posting up and it's, it's distance, 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 trying to uh, get 200 yards with his seven iron. Uh, and he's constantly changing his practice routine based upon what he's learning. Uh, and he's, I don't know if he's going to golf tech or uh, club champion or uh, wherever he's going, but um, what kind of practice routines would you like to carry over from those lessons uh, to your students when they get on the course in order to reinforce these changes in a system before they uh, make their swing? Uh, do you mean practice routine like a pre-shot routine? Yeah, yeah, pre-shot pre routine. Kind of mainly what I I mean if they're taking yeah. like swings on the tee box what they what they kind of do to reinforce whatever they're learning if you if you say you know if we're working on on club path maybe your first practice or your pre shot routine your first practice swing you're just taking the club uh, parallel to the ground looking at the club face and you know just trying to <laughs> gotcha. get it square. Yeah, so I would say whatever the practiced, uh, whatever the pre-shot routine feeling is should match whatever it is that they're trying to do. So if we've worked in the lesson on trying to change the path to get the hand path to work more in, then I would say your practice swing should be an exaggerated version of that feeling. And then you're just taking that feeling when you go up to hit the ball. That's it. So um, I think sometimes what can happen is people can get themselves going too far sideways too quickly. So they'll start getting into it and going, yeah, I want to change this to happen. I want to get the 
hands to move more in or whatever, and then they step up over the ball and they're thinking, you know, oh gosh, I don't want to push this to the right in the trees or do I have the right club? So um, there's a great book out there called um, Play Your Best Golf Now. And I think they have it written in another one, but Pia Nielsen and Lynn Marriott, um, they wrote the uh, about the uh, think box and the play box, which is a great way to um, get data and then be able to put it into playing a shot. So their think box is where you would do all that, where you're assessing what's happening with the shot. You know, what club are you going to use? What's the distance? What the elevation is? Make your decision. And once you have your decision, you then can do your practice routine in that think box. And then once you go in to play the shot, there's no more decisions that are being made. You're just going in there with whatever that feeling is. So that's one where, you know, if we're talking about what does each person need, everybody's so individual. They're going to need all different types of stuff. So it's hard to say. But that, that would be kind of the best way to do it is to make sure that before you go to hit the shot, you have a very clear idea of what it is that you're going to feel and then just go ahead and do it. Uh, did you see the uh, new training aid that George Genghis came out with, the G-Box? Mm -mm. You should take a look and it, it's something that you kind of put around your waist. If you ever see him during a lesson, he has one of his teaching assistants grabbing on, or he's behind one of the students grabbing onto their waist. And when they hit the, or when they get to the top of the backswing and they're about to transition um, to the downswing, he has that teaching assistant try to fire around those hips. So you should uh, see uh, the G box that George Genghis is going to be releasing out soon. It, it hmm. looks pretty cool. And just from a teaching standpoint, if you want to check that out, uh, sure. Mike and I were talking about it for a while yesterday. Uh, hey, uh, Kevin, um, yeah. what about um, people stepping in the bucket, you know, taking that left lead foot and stepping in the bucket when the next swing come through? What do you mean? You know, as, as far as a, a drill to counteract that. You know, so, you know, in baseball, they call it stepping in the bucket. When you swing, you take that left lead foot and step to the left. Instead of they're stepping in the bucket, in other words, they're taking their weight and falling kind of like to the left through the swing, to like a driver swing. Uh, like their weight is moving towards and the what? target. No, it's it's, it's more that's moving left. So another it's like, it's like, it's like in baseball, you step in the bucket. So when you swing, that left foot opens up to the to the lead foot, which is on your left hand, steps okay. out to the left. It's almost yeah. like, you know, clearing your hip, you, you know, when you're clearing your left hip, yeah. you're stepping out to the left instead of, instead of like more or less down to the target to put more weight on their left foot. So you're talking about unweighting your left foot and then moving it? Correct. Yeah. Um, and for that's what purpose? Problem. I mean, I'm, you know I'm saying that's the, that's the problem they're having. Then what do you have any drills to counteract? Oh, that? oh, gotcha, gotcha. All right, so their left foot is moving um, in their transition into the downswing. Correct. Yeah, I would just tell them to put more weight yeah, so on their we left foot. Don't move it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you can. That would be. I would go that route. Just super simple. First, take. Can you keep your left foot still? Um, if they can't do that, then um, what I would do is uh, just starting to rate what their percentage is of um, feeling of weight in their feet. So how much weight do you feel like you have in your left foot relative to your right foot and percentage wise, and then have them do some swings to the top of the backswing and then try to keep the percentage shift the same. So if they can't do it, let's say they were at 50, 50 and they went to the top of the backswing and now they're 60, 40 and 60% 60 is on their right foot, 40% is on the left then I would go, okay, well, let's preset you so that you're 70-30, 70% 70 30, on your left, 30% on your right. Now go to the top of the backswing and keep the 70% on your left foot. So once they get to that point where they're keeping more weight over on the left, it's pretty hard to move that foot around if you've got weight on it. Yeah, but it's, it's more or less in the follow-through than in the... 
so they've now hit the ball and their left foot slides correct and it's not just a little slide but almost a pick up and, and again step into the bucket they're actually stepping into like a range bucket yeah uh, i'm not sure i'm or not sure I'm, have like a bucket where when they're coming through they just you don't want them to knock it over correct yeah uh, okay yeah, I would say that, you know, a lot of that is relative to whatever the problem is that they're happening, they're having. So if they're making good contact with it and the ball flight is, you know, what they want to have or what you want them to be doing, who cares? Um, if it's creating problems with them being able to control where the club's hitting the ground or what they're doing with the club path, then I would change it. It's, it's coming in a little thin. You know, it's it's, it's because it's, I think with that with that rotation, with that step in the bucket, it's kind of raising you up, and it's it's catching the thin, catching the thin just just a touch. You know, the that ball still getting be. out there. It could be. There's a lot that can be related to uh, low point problems, so it could be it could be that that they're changing their um, changing their forward bend in their downswing, and that their uh, torso is starting to move more vertical. Um, it could also be that they're bending their arms too much, so their elbows are getting farther apart. It could be that their lead wrist is extending too quickly. Um, it could be that their path is too far to the left. There's probably four or five different things it could be. So I think you would likely want to look at all of those different elements first um, before trying to change something like that. But I'm not I'm still not 100% sure I understand what it is that you're talking about, but I think I'm kind of kind of close. Um, but I would say if they're struggling with low point problems, I would just get more weight on their left foot so it's harder for them to move it. All right, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure if that totally answered your question or not, but um, hopefully that gave you a little something to do. All right, now I, I think uh, you answered this question earlier in regards to different playing conditions, um, but it's how, how do you utilize the hitting area at golf tech for players to transfer it over to the golf course but uh you did mention that uh you have a setup where you do unusual conditions uphill downhill side hill uh you have that all available in the in the hitting area we've got a board that we use for that where we can have them hit off of it so it's just something we built that can simulate some of those lie conditions but um, and just talk generally about how people need to set up. Most of the time, I would say when people are instructing how students should set up relative to uneven lies, it's done incorrectly. Um, it's done a lot based off of just the dogma of what's out there and how it's been taught for you know, 50 years and just not very accurate. And then also for the student to understand how much the lie is going to influence the ball flight. Um, so those things are used in the bay, but we do do outdoor lessons. We do outdoor short game lessons and playing lessons where we talk about those things as well. So transferring it to the golf course is tricky um, because most of the time, the way that I look at it is when they're in the bay, I'm trying to teach them a specific skill set. So they have to have the skill to be able to make good contact with the ball and control the ball flight in perfect conditions. If they can't do that in perfect conditions, I'm not super concerned whether or not they can do it on an uneven lie because they can't even do it when it's flat. So um, in some scenarios when I'm doing the lessons relative to the uneven lies and transferring it to the course, it's on a more general basis. So you kind of need to be doing this. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it's going to give you a better chance to make contact with it. And you're never going to hit those shots great anyways just because the lie is uneven and it's not easy to make good contact with it. So setting that expectation of here's what I would think the result would be based off of what's going on is another piece. Okay. Now those skill sets that you're teaching them when they're on their own, how, um, what kind of assignments do you kind of uh, give them uh, when, if they're saying, oh, okay, they're playing Saturday and Sunday, or they're going to just practice Saturday and then they're, they're playing Sunday. Uh, yeah. What, uh, things do you offer to them for, for them to, reinforce those skill sets so um, that's one where we're fortunate that um, typically our students will take the lesson with us they'll take a 30-minute lesson with us and then they'll have a 30-minute practice in the bay 
So we'll give them something very specific that it is that they need to do for that half hour. And then they just go through and try to work the feeling. Now, I would say all of the time we're providing that information with good intentions. Very rarely do students follow through with it. They typically hit like five shots, how we tell them to, and then they just start looking at the ball flight and they're not looking at their swing at all. So um, I would say that as you're providing instruction on students for what to practice, you have to make it super, super simple. So um, one that we used to do was providing people how many repetitions we'd want them to do. So it would be, hey, I want you to do 100 swings, and I want 80 of those 100 swings to have the club coming underneath the plane line. And I'm like, to be perfectly honest, I'm not going to freaking count to 100. <laughs> so there's no way our students are going to sit there and count to 100 to be able to tell what it is, whether or not they've done 80 or not. They don't really care. So it just made it super simple of, I just want every swing to come under the plane line, period. Mm -hmm. um, or if they're outside practicing, again, super simple. I want every ball to curve to the left. I don't really care how much. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you could do in there with the you know different games and stuff that you have them play, but the games have got to be easy. They've got to be simple. Um, don't give students anything that's really difficult unless it's like a tour player, um, you know, because they're the ones that probably can be that specific if they need to be. But even still, from the, some of the stories I've heard from what uh, Nick Clearwater's told me and from other big teachers out there that are teaching tour players, they're just like every other golfer. I mean, there's really no difference other than the fact that they just have an incredible amount of skill to be able to play the game. Yeah, and they're also not practicing eight hours a day, seven days a week, too, where they can yeah, fix whatever they're working on as well. Right. They're getting maybe three one-hour sessions at best. Uh, not even. So I think this is one that is probably a good point to just have this quick discussion about it. But um, when I first came to Golf Tech, I was under the impression that everybody that was coming in was going to practice and they were going to play and everything was going to be good. I was going to give them the instruction they were going to do it. And I held a lot of my students accountable to, you know, hey, you're not practicing. Why are you not practicing? Well, then I got married and I had kids. And I realized that people just don't have the time to do that. I mean, when you're married and you have kids and you have a job, you know, your job is going to take up probably 80% of your work week or maybe 70% of your work week. You've got 30% of the rest of the time that you have. And you're going to want to spend some time with your kids and some time with your wife and you got to be home to do all these things. So to believe that a student that is not retired, that's working, that has a family is going to practice more than one time a week is just crazy. I mean, it's just not going to happen. So um, there are some that will do that for sure. And I've got some students that are practicing that have, you know, wife, kids and a very successful job. and <laughs> they're doing tons of practice, just kind of like, all right, if that's what you want to do with your time, I don't really care. It's not my decision. But um, I think we just have to go into the lessons with the idea that when we give somebody the instruction, if they practice it, if they practice it, they're probably not going to practice it the way that we want. And then if they go out to the golf course, they're going to try to do it on the golf course for maybe the first two or three holes, and then it won't work. It's going to produce some bad results. They'll go right back to what they're doing, and then they're going to come back and see us next week, and they're going to be doing it all over again, which is totally fine. That is just okay. It doesn't mean that we're bad instructors. We then just need to make sure that as we're giving our lessons to our students, they need to be simple. Don't make them complicated because they're not going to be able to handle it, and they're not going to be able to transfer it to the course to make it work. Okay. Now, uh, how did you continue the business during the COVID-19 pandemic? Did you just do all this online? And when the governor kind of opened up courses in Maryland, uh, do you still, do you have lessons at Golf Tech now? I mean, the, according yeah, so, to Maryland, they, it says practice facilities may be open with social distancing, but they also say congregation areas such as pro shops, clubhouses uh, remain closed. Yeah, so um, so for the what we did during the time, 
we're very fortunate that we have a fantastic teaching quality team and they've been doing producing tons of content so we've had um actually about probably between eight and 15 hours of content that we can go through and do each week um, that's produced by the teaching quality team relative to how to conduct better putting lessons um, some discussions with other prominent uh, teachers out there uh, Nick Clearwater's done a, a great job with um, Cordy who does golf science lab and so they've done a bunch of podcasts and stuff like that and zoom calls with some other instructors and talked about some great topics so we have just tons of information which is great um, and uh, most of our coaches have been doing that and keeping up client communication so we've been sending emails and doing virtual lessons with them so we do have our teaching software is on ipads and um, so we're able to then um, it's our own proprietary stuff, the same thing that we would have in the Bay, but we put that on an iPad so that, that way um, coaches can still do lessons at home. We do have virtual lessons that we're offering now that just released last week. So um, anybody in the country can go on for free. They get two free virtual lessons, which is a Zoom call. And we'll also uh, pull up our teaching software and analyze their swing and talk to them about their game. So we've been keeping pretty busy. As to the outdoor and indoor operations, you know, obviously right now we can't teach inside yet, so they haven't um, opened the non-essential businesses yet. But um, for outdoor instruction, now that the golf courses are open, we are planning on doing that. We have um, probably like seven or eight major protocols that we're following to be able to conduct those lessons. Um, so the biggest one is that we're every, every day a coach has to do a self-screen of making sure that they don't have a fever and um, any of the symptoms related to it. And then all of our coaches are wearing mastering lessons, so outdoor or indoor. And then once the facility opens, the guidelines will be pretty strict on what coaches and students can and can't do. But certainly keeping it as a no touch lesson is gonna be a, sometimes a challenge and a change. Um, certainly for indoor, that will be difficult. We will stu still do club fittings, but club fitting protocols are changing slightly as we're going through this and starting to open up across the country just to make sure we keep everybody safe. But Excellent. All right, we have about uh, 22 minutes. Let me just go through a couple. Um, I'm gonna get down to the club fitting aspect since we're running a little bit uh behind but we're getting a ton of information from you kevin which is which is great but uh over to dan um when we get to wedge fitting what what key topics uh do you like to discuss in a wedge fitting uh while you're uh either doing an iron fitting as well uh, and the kind of configuration if you don't know if they prefer just regular wedges from the company or wedges in the iron set just kind of discuss with us what you kind of typically do. Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> the big thing with the wedge fitting is a lot of folks when we're doing the fittings, and I'm sure Kevin has ran into this as well, uh, a lot of people aren't really sure which wedges they should be utilizing in their bag. And so when we do the wedge fittings, uh, you know, we try to get an understanding of uh, what kind of conditions they normally play in, uh, course conditions. Some people travel around. Uh, some people play the same course over and over. So when uh, when you're tailoring, you know, a setup for a, a player's wedge, do their wedge fittings, uh, you definitely want to go ahead and uh, we simply go with the process of, you know, asking them, okay, Let's uh, hit your, your pitching wedge that came with the set. Uh, let's see, uh, let's find out your distance that you can have it and try to help people get, you know, properly gap between their pitching wedge and their, their whatever wedge that they want to go down to, whether it be a sandwich or, you know, maybe the 58, 60, or Phil Mickelson 64. I've yet to see anybody get the 64 in their bag yet. Um, but trying to help them to understand the, the importance of the wedges 
and, and getting them properly fit to set up their makeup so that they can cover those yardages, and their pitching wedge on down. So it's, uh, some people, uh, you, you can ask some people, how many wedges are you looking to carry in your bag? Uh, you know, some people, I don't know, how many do you think I need? So that's the thing that you have to do as, you know, the, the fitter and sometimes as the coach as well is, uh, you know, I ask them, okay, what, what's going on when you're playing? Are you uh, having trouble with your wedges? Is there numbers that you're having trouble, you know, hitting, you know, hitting from? So uh, a lot of, a lot of the clubs nowadays, uh, they, uh, they're coming with, you know, you get them with a pitching wedge, see it, the gap wedge or attack wedge, uh, the sand wedge. Uh, some people are very comfortable to have those already put, you know, in their makeup, their set makeup. So some people like to have uh, the set that comes with uh, whoever the vendor is. And some people like to go with, let's go ahead and uh, get set up with you know, separate wedges versus the ones that come with the uh, set itself. But playing conditions, bottom line is playing conditions. You have to understand uh, and talk to the, uh, the customer and find out what it is that uh, they're looking for, you know, what kind of playing conditions they play in. Okay, and uh, how, are, how do you kind of uh, educate them on the different bounces, but also the now that we got into grinds with uh, the Vokies and Callaway got into grinds as well, similar to, to TaylorMade. How do you educate them on, on the need of uh, a K grind or an M grind or just an S grind on their wedges? Sure. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, the grinds and the different types of grinds out there, no matter who the vendor is, they're all, they all may, may label them different, but they're all pretty much the same thing uh, from a fitting side and uh, you know club builder side uh, and so when you're talking to them you know you ask them when you're you're around the greens when you're utilizing your wedges uh, do you like to keep your wedges square do you like to open up your wedge uh, so based on how they answer that question well uh, will help you better educate them okay this this grind because of the way it's built will work better for you because you prefer to open up your wedge. And so that's going to have better turf interaction with it. So again, it's very important to listen to your customer as you're going through the fitting and find out how they utilize your wedge. Uh, do they keep it square uh, at setup? Do they like to open it up? Uh, that's, that's the biggest thing. And then just explain to them, why this grind uh, will give them the best interaction with the turf based on, again, what kind of uh, soil are they playing? Are they playing firm? Are they playing uh, soft soil? Uh, okay. Now, um, as companies, they there really is no standard in golf anymore. TaylorMade is completely different with Mizuno. Mizuno is completely different with Callaway. Uh, do you like to keep them in the in the same manufacturer when you get to wedges, or you might find out you know they'll better utilize the Callaway Jaws wedges amongst the Vokies, or do you just try to keep them Titleist Titleist? I, that it becomes player specific. Uh, there's a lot of players uh, they could be playing tailor made uh, irons and uh, all their clubs except. Uh, they prefer to have the bulky, Tylus bulky wedges or Callaway. Uh, so it's all player specific. You know, bottom line is I always tell people, you know, club heads are like shoes. You're the one who has to look down at it. And, you know, if the shoe doesn't look good, uh, you're going to be embarrassed. And the same thing with a club head. So your chances are if you have a, a club head that doesn't look good. I example, some people look at the uh, – the, the Phil Mickelson wedge. Uh, they look at it and they say, man, there's just no way I can play this thing. Uh, so uh, appearance is a big thing. But yes, as far as uh, staying with the same, uh, try never to let them decide. 
let them choose which wedges and which wedge uh, manufacturer. Some people have been playing bulky wedges uh, their whole life. Some people don't know which one is best for them. So just a, it's, it's an educational thing. Okay, I was uh, discussing, uh, or well, the sales rep for Mizuno was discussing with me, uh, this with me about three years ago uh, when he was just updating me on different uh, fitting uh, that they were doing with the PFS system. And he was mentioning whatever you fit for their iron set, try to blend that in to their wedge set. If you see them uh, using a, a Project X 5.5, you might want them to use it for their 52 and their 54 and their, or, or 56 or, or 60, you know, straight down to the, the lowest club that they have in their bag just in order to kind of keep a similarity from their four all the way down to their highest lofted wedge. Do you kind of believe in that? Or do you just want to do a stock shaft, whether it's stiff or regular? No, oh, I, I, I guess to answer the first question, do I believe in it? No. Uh, and most uh, fitters will not. Uh, when it comes to the wedges, uh, manufacturers, the shaft manufacturers are, have come a long way and uh, they've developed, uh, all the different manufacturers have developed uh, some very nice uh, shafts to help her, that wedge perform the way it needs to perform. So as far as having somebody maybe with the gap wedge, uh, call it the 48, 52, uh, maybe, maybe go with whatever they, they fitted for their irons. Uh, but uh, nine times out of 10, very seldom not. Not a believer in it. Uh, put, put a wedge shaft in there that's gonna help that wedge perform the way it needs so you can get the maximum performance out of it. Okay, now Kevin, over at Golf Tech, how do you kind of typically run a club fitting if they're going driver all the way down to wedge and, and you're fitting for different shafts uh, for their driver fairway wood hybrid and then and then their irons how do you kind of make a consistent uh, basis uh, amongst their swing because their swing could be different with their woods could be different with their irons what do you kind of typically do over at uh, golf tech if you're inside versus outside well, I would say we're definitely measuring everything to see what's going on with the ball flight and then what needs to change in order to help maximize their distance and accuracy. So um, relative to what shaft we're doing, the, um, the one thing that we've done a decent amount of studies on is um, what variables are the most important. So the biggest ones are just length and shaft flex. There's um, there is something to be said about kick points and torque and all that stuff, but um, it's very, very low in terms of its ability to influence the ball flight. And then also for it to be consistent from one person to the next. So we did some studies on that relative to, you know, we had a high kick point shaft and a low kick point shaft and had uh, four different customers of different skill levels try them. And 50% of the results were opposite of what you would expect. So oh. with a high kick point shaft, um, the it's supposed to do something and it did something else. Same thing with the torque. It didn't seem to influence it at all. But the um, one thing that we have found is shaft flex. So that's one of those where, because you're looking at fitting somebody, when we're going from driver all the way down, we're really looking to find you know, what's the club head speed, ball speed combination there, and then what shaft flex makes the most sense and getting them close. Most of the time that'll get them close enough to where they need to be in order to help them. And then um, as we're going through, we typically are gonna do woods first and then irons, um, just because if you're doing a full bag fitting all in one session, after you've done an iron fitting, they're running out of gas. So typically they hit the driver worse um, anyways, so it's better to do that first and just get that knocked out um, and then go down into the irons. So whether or not all those shafts match up and everything, some of it is just dependent on how they hit them. So um, when you're looking at fittings, you could have two different types of fittings as well. So you could do um, an off the street fitting, which is just 
somebody's coming in, you have to solve the problem for them right then. And you have to make a recommendation based off of that. And then you also have your student that's getting fitted. So with our students, we've seen their swing, we know what's gonna happen. So it's a lot easier to go through that fitting and provide a recommendation for something that they're gonna be able to play themselves into versus something that's gonna be, this is exactly what you need for right now. Um, so, uh, and then kind of uh, going down through the set, you know, from the, all of the manufacturers make pretty good products right now, kind of all the way from, you know, irons into wedges. So that's one where, you know, a lot of times just to keep things consistent, keep them in the same wedges, if we're gonna do it like an off the street thing, if the, it's kind of like Dan said, if they have a personal preference, you know, certainly go that route of switching it up. But um, it makes it really difficult. I found just personally makes it difficult to um, match up all the specs because companies change so much when you go from one manufacturer to another. This is my personal preference is to try to keep people similar. Most of the time, it's not going to make that big of a difference. Yeah, and it was just a, also a personal question as well, because my driver, Farrowwood Hybrid, they're all stiff flex, but I just went into uh, NS Pro shafts with my irons, and I'm actually in a regular flex. I did have them kind of cut down uh, the tip a little bit, because I wanted, I, it, it was in between, mm -hmm. really. It was either stiff or regular, and uh, I, I didn't want to make a big change going to regular. So I, I kind of had them stiff in the shaft a little bit. So it is between a stiff and a regular. Um, yeah. but I mean, there's, there's just some players that they, once they get that driver in their bag or their fairway wood and their hybrid, they just swing faster for some reason. They just want to mutilate it. And then once they get that seven iron in their bag, they're hitting it a little, they're swinging a little bit slower with a, a little less speed and it's not in relation to the length of the club it's just they don't want to hit their seven iron so fast not, not as fast as they hit their hybrid or anything and then it's just how they how they play the game so i just wanted to see if you yeah. want to keep it consistent stiff 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 all the way across the board i would say i would say not necessarily the one thing that we do with all of our fittings is we use a frequency analyzer to measure the shaft that they currently are playing. And man, I have seen it all the way across the board. I had a lady come in that had, um, she had uh, lady shafts and they were, uh, they frequencied off the chart in terms of flexibility. There wasn't even a number. You couldn't even go, like we have the chart and it's got junior, yeah. it's got ladies and then junior flex. And it was all the way at the very, very bottom of the list. I mean, they're, there literally wasn't even a number for it. It was, um, a noodle. <laughs> it was a noodle. Yeah. And then there's other times where I had somebody come in and they had a regular flex and a frequency out to be an extra stiff. And it's so, I mean, it's all over the map. Certainly the manufacturers like Dan saying is getting better, but the, um, yeah, I mean, if somebody's got clubs that are more than four or five years old, any club driver all the way down, I almost could guarantee you that the shaft flex does not match. If it's a graphite shaft, it doesn't match what it says on the shaft. Very rarely does that happen. The steel shafts are pretty close, but there's some variability in that too. You see a big difference between uh, shafts that are coming from the manufacturer versus uh, off-market, like exotic shafts. And uh, if you um, the amount of whiteboard from Titleist, but then you yeah. buy a Diamond of whiteboard off the like off the internet from uh, just and it's coming straight from Diamond. Do you ever see uh, a variation? I don't know that I could speak to that a whole lot because we just don't really test that many of those. But um, what I will tell you, what I know based off of manufacturing stuff, is that they'll manufacture a certain set, so they might manufacture X Flex. When those come off of the line, they take the top percentage of those shafts and those go on the tour truck. Um, and then there's another percentage that are kind of like backups and then the rest of it is all mass market. Um, so, you know, the best of the best product is not going to our consumer, it's going to the tour. Um, so the consumer is still getting a good product, doesn't mean they're getting a bad one, it just means it's not, it's not perfect like some of the other items are. 
but I, I would say until you go in and actually frequency out each shaft, it'd be really difficult to do that. Manufacturers are not going to spend the time to do that. It's just going to take too long. Understandable. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any, uh, well, I should have changed Todd Sammons to Michelle, uh, but anybody have any questions for Michelle in regards to their work experience, portfolio, testing and seminars, any issues that have come up while you've been working and she can uh, resolve those? Brendan or Alex or, or Tyler, I'm not sure if you're still on. Uh, any more questions for, for Kevin in regards to the biomechanics, what he's doing over at Golf Tech, his, uh, his teaching practices? Or, oh, this, this has been awesome. Great. And any questions for Dan? He's, uh, he's on the correct, he's with the correct uh, company in terms of uh, a staff player. He's with uh, Callaway. Um, <laughs> oh, Jeffrey. Uh, that, but, uh, yeah, uh, I just want to thank you once again uh, for donating your time to speak and give us your expertise. I uh, greatly appreciate it. And, uh, we're definitely going to utilize uh, this once we are able to give lessons again um, at the facility. Uh, but if you want to look at a few of the mentors that uh, spoke, uh, you can see the teaching and coaching club performance. We had Joanna Coe, Jim Estes, Kevin and Dan. Uh, for golf ops, we had Joe, Franz, Mike Healy, Jason Mills, and then John Stefan will be on in uh, a half hour. Um, and uh, Christine, thank you very much for your assistance. I greatly appreciate it. Um, and if you have any questions in regard to your book work <laughs> and vouch for this, please call the mentor service over at the Education Center. Um, when I was doing it over the winter, I think I called maybe three times a week for about two months. Um, I had them on speed dial. So I, was, I just wanted to get it out of the way and I just asked question after question and they assisted me. Um, but other than that, uh, the golf operations um, video will start in approximately 33 minutes. So you have some downtime. Uh, if you need to go back to the link, it's on the email I sent out. But uh, once again, Dan and Kevin, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Kevin, keep, Kevin, keep doing what you guys are doing at Golf Tech. like the information that's coming out of there. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. Absolutely. We'll keep it coming. All Thank right. You. Everybody be safe. Stay healthy.